Fearless and determined, Louise Arbour has served Canada and the world as a lawyer, law professor, Supreme Court of Canada justice, international jurist, and involved citizen. And in every role, the promotion and protection of human rights has been her touchstone. As head of the Commission of Inquiry into events at the Prison for Women in Kingston, Ontario, Louise pushed for limited use of segregation. Depriving someone of liberty is punishment enough, she has said. As head of the Chief Prosecutor of War Crimes before the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, she indicted Slobodan Milosevic. She made history with the first prosecution of sexual assault as a crime against humanity. But it was in her role as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights that Louise left no doubt about her mandate. She said it was her job to promote and protect all human rights for all people, everywhere, and at all times. Je ne vois pas de responsabilité plus importante et je ne vois aucune autre personne qui soit plus qualifiée et digne d'assumer cette responsabilité que Louise. La détermination dont Louise a fait preuve tout au long de sa carrière s'est manifestée à un très jeune âge. Née à Montréal, les parents de Louise étaient propriétaires d'une chaîne d'hôtels. Elle a fait ses études entièrement en français. Après avoir obtenu son diplôme en droit à l'Université de Montréal, elle est venue à Ottawa pour être greffière auprès du juge Louis-Philippe Pigeon de la Cour suprême du Canada. À l'époque, elle parlait à peine anglais, mais elle a rapidement maîtrisé la langue de Shakespeare pour en arriver, si vous me permettez ce jeu de mots, à s'exprimer de manière suprême dans les deux langues officielles. I saw that for myself in the summer of 2015 when, during the campaign for the last election, I was a guest on a Quebec TV talk show along with Louise. It was the first time we had met, and let's just say we had a very spirited discussion that I remember well to this day. After a lifetime of service to Canada and the world, no one would blame Louise if she chose to retire. But of course, she has different plans. Last month, she accepted a new appointment as the UN Special Representative for International Migration. In that role, she will continue to do what she has done throughout her career, speaking out for those whose voices are often unheard. Elle n'a peur de rien. Elle est déterminée. Et je le dis avec fierté, elle est un exemple à suivre pour beaucoup d'entre nous. Mesdames et Messieurs, Louise Arbour. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Uh, mesdames et Messieurs, I'm conscious that you've been very patient as a, an attentive audience. And I must say, I think you've been rich, richly rewarded by my predecessors. But as my turn comes, I suspect you'll be pleased to hear that my greatest ambition in life is that my epitaph should read, she was too short. <laughs> Alors, je, je voudrais tout d'abord remercier le Forum euh, pour euh, avoir fait le choix de m'inclure dans un, une brochette euh, de personnes très distinguées ce soir. Ça a été pour moi euh, une merveilleuse occasion de les entendre célébrer leur appartenance au Canada et euh, leur attachement à ce pays. However, I can't continue just in that uh, line of romanticism about our great country. You've heard it all. I think you're basking in this spirit of uh, 
of the, the, the great sense of belonging to, to this country, and, and that's, I think, a, a totally appropriate. So what I want to do is just take a few minutes tonight to, to share with you maybe something a little more sobering, and in particular to address with you briefly some concerns I have about the challenges of advancing uh, policy, uh, social justice type policies in an international environment. So just moving out a bit of our, of our zone of comfort. And I'll single out one single challenge above and beyond the obvious difficulty of reconciling competing national interests of sovereign states, which of course are not accountable individually or even collectively to world public opinion. One would think that in a world that is shrinking in many ways with globalization and heightened communication technologies, differences between people would be reduced in favor of a more easily reachable consensus. And yet, it's pretty clear that the number and the intensity of existing conflicts, including raging wars, should suffice to dispel this plausible assumption. So I cannot quite put a name to what I see as this, as this emerging challenge. It is actually a disconnect. It, in fact, it's probably a confrontation between the different methodologies with which we apprehend the world. While I thought, and I think most of you thought for a long time, that we were making progress towards evidence-based policies, I now see that the ground is shifting away from facts and knowledge in favor sometimes of mere assumptions and beliefs. Most of us here are comfortable in a modern policy environment which is essentially reasoned, formal, informed by academic inputs and anchored in rules and in systems. But this methodology is now being confronted not so much with the competing ideology but just with a very different view of reality. One that is based on personal choices and preferences, anchored in relationships, in gut feelings, a world in which what you know is based solely on what you choose to believe, which in turn reflects who you like without having to explain why. And both sides of this great divide are constantly reinforced in their own view of the world estranged, completely estranged from one another. From where I stand now, I find that these competing views make it very difficult to find a descriptive common ground from which to debate policy options. Allegedly equally valid alternative realities compete as a foundation for policy choices. And this, I believe, is a very serious setback in the already difficult arena of policymaking exacerbated in a large multinational environment. But to close my remarks alluding to what Elika Lafontaine said earlier today, at least I could fall back in the area of expectation. This is the one area where I believe the International Forum presents a real advantage to policymakers. In this area of expectation, I think it's fair to say that international consensus on difficult issues is a little bit like the dog dancing paradigm. It's really never a question of how well they dance, it's just a miracle they're dancing at all. <laughs> I have recently re-entered the dance floor. Wish me luck. Thank you very much.